my shepherd I shall not want He maketh me to lie down in green pasture He leadeth me beside the waters of rest He restoreth my soul Prepares me a table before my enemies. Though I walk through the valley, I will not fear. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort. I shall not want He leadeth me in paths of righteousness Thou anointest me with oil My cup overflows I'll dwell in thy house forever Test, test. It's a beautiful day here in Oklahoma City. My name is Brother John with Christ Forgiveness Ministries. I've come out here to share the gospel to all of you to talk about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I lived for a number of years in Oklahoma, so I'm always grateful to come back here, especially on a beautiful day like this where the weather is nice. So I hope that uh, you will hear these words. And for those of you who have not received the Lord into your life. We hope that you come talk with us and we'd be more than happy to share the gospel with you. Now, one thing that surprises me is that there are people here in the West that do not know what the gospel is. I grew up in a place where I find it very difficult that anyone could not know. But in case you do not know, the gospel comes from the Greek word euangelion. It means the good, happy news, or as Christians call it, the good news. There are many ways to describe the gospel, uh, but the way that I tend to, to, tend to describe it comes from Romans, and it starts simply by this, uh, reading from Romans 3.23, and it says, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if you don't know what it means to sin, sin simply means breaking God's law or his morality. Whether you realize it or not, you are part of his creation. You didn't happen by a random accident. And as such, you're living in his world, and he's set the world in a certain way. Whenever you fail to live by his standards, you have sinned or you have broken his law. And the reality is all of us have done so in some form or another. Some of you may say, well, that's not really fair. I didn't know what the rules were. No one told me. But just like in the courts, where it says ignorance of the law is not a defense, is not a uh, a defense before God. The fact is God has given you plenty of evidence of his, his life here in the world. It's made evident in Romans 1.20. But we also have examples, and you're welcome if you'd like any of those, those are free, you're welcome to take whatever you like. And so there's plenty of evidence. We also have God's word in the Bible, so you can read about his morality, you can read about his message. There's no excuse here in the West not to receive it. We have free Bibles here that anyone's welcome to have them. You can also read it online at BibleGateway.com, all for free. So here in the West, with all of our advantages, there's no excuse not to know God's Word. The challenge for people in the West living a life of privilege is whether they will receive the Word and humble themselves for it. Which goes to my second verse in Romans 6, 23, and it reads, the wages of sin is death. The fact is, when we sin, when we break God's law, just like if you worked a job, you accrue wages, you also accrue wages when you sin. And when you accrue sin, when you accrue those wages, the result is death because you're in violation of that relationship with your creator. But the rest of the verse reads, because I told you this may, you're like, this doesn't sound like good news at all. And it would not be except that there is another part to the verse. 
It says this, and I'll read it in full. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You see, God is a loving God. We know this in the Bible because it tells us 1 John 4, 8 and 1 John 4, 16. But it is also important to know that God loves us in such a way that he allows us to have free will, which means we have the choice on whether to follow him or whether to ignore him. Every single time you may have violated God's law, you could have chosen otherwise. Every time that temptation may have happened to tell a lie, for example, you could have chosen not to lie. You could have chosen not to gossip. You could have chosen not to engage in sexual sin. You always have the ability to choose otherwise. And the reason for that is God gives you free will out of love for you. He wants you to have a loving relationship with you where you have the choice. Because if he denied you the choice, because some people will, why did God create a world where you could choose to do evil things? Then it would not be love on his part or your part. It would be like if you were in a relationship with someone, you could press a button to have them do what you want. So God has not set the world in that way, but God, as I said, is a God of love and he knows that we still fall short at times. And so what he has done to help us, even though that we are in trouble before God, is that he allowed his son to come down in human form to give us the opportunity to receive eternal life. Because when he died on the cross, when he was crucified, he led a sinless life, a perfect life. And that's important because his perfection was the atonement. His perfection was the pain of the debt for our fines. Because as I said before, we've all sinned. So we all have a penalty before God. However, God in his love for us allowed Jesus Christ to take that debt upon us. And as such, we come to Romans 10, 13. It reads, for, who, for whosoever shall call upon the Lord's name shall be saved. And so you can be saved if you're willing to humble yourself, if you're willing to embrace God and his morality, if you're willing to put God first in your life, if you're willing to reject sin, if you're willing to pick up your cross daily, you can be saved through Christ, you can be purified, and you can receive eternal life. Many of you may not realize it, but this life is a, a temporary life. The best of us usually have maybe 70 or 80 years, and then we die, and yet many of us will know other folks who didn't live nearly that young, dying from a car accident or a cancer diagnosis or some other immediate thing where they did not live as many years as they thought. But the fact is there is an afterlife beyond this life, and that afterlife is eternal. Many people do not give thought to the next life. They live their life only for this one, and it shows in their actions and their choices. And that's a grave mistake. That's a mistake that I did on most of my life and many others. I was one who grew up in the church. I grew up in the Methodist church and I had fond memories of the church, no incidents. I had good memories of it. And yet, as I grew older, I grew out of the church. I wasn't interested in reading the Bible. I wasn't interested in following God's morality. I was interested in doing what I wanted to do, which oftentimes was not in accord with God, what God had wanted for me. And though my example is not unique, if you want to know my ultimate sin in life was idolatry, I worshiped money. I lived my life around the pursuit of money. I thought that's what mattered the most. The more money I made, that made me an important person that when I walk down the street, they say, oh, that is someone to be reckoned with. All because of how much money I, I had. That's what I was obsessed with. And I lived my life through that. When I built my business, my aim was again to gain as much money as I could. And my choices and how I treated people was a direct result of that because if you could not help me, then I was not interested in you. If I could step over you to be more successful, then I would do it. Because again, my God, my idol was that money. That was what I pursued. And it influenced all my thoughts and influenced my relationships. And it took for me, it took my business to crumble before I humbled myself. And that's the case. Many people will be living their lives a certain way, happy in the world, content. 
and then something will happen. Someone close to them will die. And they'll start to wonder, what is life really all about? There's the things that I think matter. Do they really truly matter in the end? Because here's the reality, we are all going to die. 10 out of 10 people will pass away. I don't say these words to scare you. I say these words as a warning to ask yourself, are you on the right path? Are you making the right choices that at the end of your days, you'll be able to say that I lived a life that honored God, that honored myself and honored my family. Because for myself, what I had to recognize was I was not on the right path. I had chosen false things. I was chasing after that money. And so when my business crumbled, I had an opportunity to think about these deeper philosophical questions that I would usually just push aside when it would come to me in the middle of a dream or, or while in the middle of an afternoon. And now for once, I did not want to hide from those questions. I did not want to get distracted by yet another thing in my life. And I doubt that I'm alone in that. I think many people follow a similar path. You may not have the same sin that I did, you may be chasing after other things. A lot of young women in the world chased after beauty. They make that their, their idol, trying to forever be young, trying to get the attention of a man. And yet it's elusive and it will not sustain you in the long run. That beauty is passing and your life is passing too. It says in James 4.14, what is your life but a vapor that appeareth for a moment in time and vanishes. Your days will run faster from you. Talk to any old timer you can find and ask them, and they will say, it was just like yesterday I was in school. It was just like then. And that time will pass you by in an instant. You will not be young as long as you think, and these choices will catch up to you. And if you choose to ignore the choices, time will make that decision for you. And so that's why we're here today as a warning to call you to repentance, to call you before God so you can receive his word and so you can be changed so that you can receive eternal life. And we call you to start to think about these things because everyone is on a different plane. You may have come from an environment where the idea of Christianity sounds crazy to you. Maybe you come from an atheistic viewpoint where that's all you've heard. I'm here to challenge you to start to think about these things in a deeper way. Don't get caught up with the distractions of the day. That football game you may be thinking about, that boyfriend, girlfriend you may be thinking about, are they gonna be here with you a couple years from now? Are you even gonna care about that game five years from now? All these things can distract from your relationship with God. They can distract from thinking about what is the purpose of life and where is my life going? So that's why we call upon you out of, out of love for you because we know that the change that is made in, in my life and my uh, brothers and sisters around the world, that the influence that the Holy Spirit has had on our lives. That's why it says in the Bible, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their evil ways and the unrighteous their thoughts and return to the Lord where they may receive mercy and be abundantly pardoned. Because the reality is, if you're hearing this message, recognize that you may not be here next year. You're not promised next year. You're not promised a next time. This may be the only time that you're hearing this message. And so no matter how foreign it may sound to you, we're calling out to you in the hopes that you will take it with you and think about it. If you have questions, come to us and talk to us about it. We'd be grateful to share with you our own testimonies. A little while later here, you're gonna hear from testimonies of some of my other Christian brothers. One of the beautiful things about Christianity is that we share a common faith. And even though I've met these gentlemen today, the fact is their stories aren't so different from mine. And we all share a common group of values. And we all believe in the value that the Holy Spirit has given on our lives and changed us and transformed us. Because that's what happens for me. I told you that my, my idol was money, and that's what I chased after. That's what I obsessed about, getting these things and being the very much materialist. But now, after my coming to Christ, I just don't care about those things. 
those conversations about, hey, did you hear about this? And that's a great way it'll double your money. Those things no longer interest me in the way they did. They just, they're just not as important. Because having all the money in the world amounts to nothing if you're not right with God. You can have all the things. You can have all the things in the world. You can have all the women. You can have all the men. You can have all the anything your heart's desired. But if you do not have God, it will be short-lived. It will not sustain. The law of diminishing returns will kick in. And this life will be ultimately miserable. And the worst part is it will come to an end. And you will not have prepared for the next life. You will not have even sought after your creator. To think about that, that someone is given you life, has given you breath, and has hope and purpose for you, and you reject him. How would you feel if you were the creator? Many people these days will live their life for something. We all do this. And if you're not living for God, the question I have for you is what are you living your life for? What are you pursuing? What keeps you excited? What are you filling your days with? A lot of people choose to escape from the world and they'll chase after drugs or alcohol or sex or any other thing to escape from the pressures of the world to get some relief, even if it's for a moment. But that's all it is, is relief for a moment. We're offering you something else, not through our own power, but through the power of God. We're offering you the opportunity to have a relationship with someone that deeply loves you. The Bible says that God has a steadfast love that remains forever. What do you know about a love like that in this world where marriages can be broken up even after a, a couple years where people can jump from one partner to another where people will step over each other if it suits them and yet God has a steadfast love for you that remains and endures forever how beautiful is that that there is someone out there in this world that could have that type of love for you why wouldn't you want to have that in your life? Why wouldn't you want to embrace after folks that are seeking after that type of belief? There's so much wickedness in the world. There's so many things that we can point to that say this should be better or this is wrong. And yet there is a love for you that is steadfast and endures forever. And so I want you to know, we'll talk about many things tonight, but the one thing I want you to know is that God does indeed love you. There'll be groups that will come out here and try to tell you that that love is only reserved for certain groups or that uh, you have to do certain things to earn God's love. And that isn't true. God will take you as you are. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your skin color, where you were born, whether you were poor, whether you're rich, whether you were the dumbest in your class or the brightest. God welcomes you. He welcomes you all. He is not an elitist. He is not a respecter of persons. And never forget that. Never let anybody tell you otherwise. Because there are so many mixed messages out in the world today. They try to belittle God. They try to usurp power and claim that they are gods themselves. And yet it's folly. Because no one here on this earth could create this. They could create this beautiful sky. They could create this beautiful world. They are pretenders. And you should give your devotion to someone who does have the ability to create all this because he is all powerful, but also because of that steadfast love for each and every one of you. Now, unfortunately, not everyone will choose steadfast love out of ego, or they'll have the belief that they know better, they can do better than God even though they are a finite being, even though they've made mistakes, even the best of us. I know I've made plenty of mistakes in my life, even simple uh, arithmetic mistakes. 
And so I don't know where that type of arrogance comes from, yet some people will choose to reject God despite plenty of evidence of his existence, and they will choose to go their own way. I had a friend growing up, we used to play ball together, bright young man, doing well, he went to college, married a, a beautiful sorority girl, and his life seemed to be on the way up. He was getting the jobs that he wanted, he, was, he seemed to be fulfilled. And yet these things got to his head. He started to look upon his life about the things that he didn't have. He started to nitpick. And he started to, to erode his own marriage by his own choice. As he started to decide that uh, his wife wasn't satisfying enough. And he started to look outside the relationship to seek after affairs. Where it became commonplace. And this is what happens when you sin, you start to erode your, your conscience. You start to make bad choices. Then you, a choice that you would have never made when you first started to uh, start to sin. With time, you start to become comfortable with it. You will corrode and harden your heart. And in time, you will not want to stop sinning. And that's what happened to him. He ended up becoming a... Uh, unfortunately, he became a, well, not unfortunately, but he became a high school history professor. But as you might be able to surmise, he didn't stop dating girls his own age. He ended up actually starting an affair with one of his underage students. And as these things always happen, what's done in the dark shows up in the light, and his life was destroyed. And his life was destroyed because of his selfishness, that he was only thinking about what he lacked, and because he did not have a basis in God, and he did not have a belief that God's morality mattered, he destroyed his life as a young man, and he will never be able to get that back. He'll never be able to get his reputation back, and he threw that all away simply because he wanted to go his own way. Now, some of you may go, well, I'm not dumb enough to make the same choice as he did, but don't be deceived. Because I remember him back in high school talking to me, and he said with conviction in his voice, we had another, uh, another coach who was rumored to be having an affair with a student. And he said, declared it proudly, I would never do that. I would never do that. And yet fast forward 20 years later, and he does the thing. Fast forward 20 years later, he's abandoned God. He's gone his own way, and he's destroyed his life. And I pray that he humbles himself. I pray that he gives his life to the Lord and he changes his path. But the big message here isn't to go, well, I haven't been as bad as that guy or this guy because that makes no difference to God. The question is, when you hear these warnings, are you going to receive them and change your life? Or are you going to be as stubborn as myself or as stubborn as my friend and keep pushing God out of the picture? Because God is calling out to you he is patient and long-suffering with you in the hopes that you will return to him. And one of the most amazing things about our God is how deep his love is. In the Bible, it has the parable of the Good Samaritan. And most people like this story where it talks about the young prodigal son who went away from home. But if you look in the details of the story, it's actually worse than it might appear. He demanded that he get his inheritance from his father and his father was still alive. Think about that for a while. He hated his father so much that he wanted nothing to do with him. He just wanted to get some money and ran. And even more amazingly, the father gives him the money. And what does the young man do? He gets caught up trying to do things his own way, getting fast friends, getting caught up with money and women and all the sins of the world. And then he runs out and he's humbled. He loses it all and he returns to his father. And the story goes from a long way off. He had resolved to apologize to his father in the hopes that he could be a servant for his father. And a long way off, the father sees him and the father runs to the son. And this is important because in the culture that they lived in, fathers, the patriarchs of the family would never run. They don't run. Maybe that's for kids. Maybe that's for a mom, but not for the father. He's going to stand on principle. That's just not done. And yet the parable, it tells that God doesn't care about any of that. 
God only cares that you returned to the fold. And that is what God's love is for each and every one of you. It does not matter what you've done. It does not matter. There is not any sins that you can think of outside of blaspheming the Holy Spirit that you cannot repent from. You can humble yourself. You can repent. You can not be too far gone where God cannot declare his love for you and bring you back. And if you're willing to humble yourself, even if that sounds too fantastic for you to believe, know this, there are people around the world. You can just Google on YouTube and you can find their testimonies of people who have gone through all types of hardships, drug addictions, sex addictions, losses, losing job after job. They even had past where they murdered folks. And yet in a time they humbled themselves and God can wash them clean and they can be changed because that is the power of God where you and I may not be able to forgive and forget. God can forgive and forget in an instant. And that's available to each and every one of you. And I hope if you have not received God in your life, you're willing to, to start to think about God. You're willing to start to think about these things and allow him to change your life. Now, of course, here in, in Bricktown, in Oklahoma, there are many people who profess with their lips that they are Christians. They've heard the story. They've heard the gospel. They grew up to church, and they feel like they've they punched their card by going to church every Sunday. And they've generally led a pretty good life. They haven't done any terrible sins in the sense of a murder or a rape or some of these types of things. And they're not perfect, but, you know, God's okay. They see God as their buddy, and God will help them. But what I want to ask you is in John 14, 15, this is Jesus talking. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so that's something that a Christian should think about. If you truly do love God, if you truly do love the gift of life he has given you, if you do truly love eternal life, then that should be fruitful. That should be seen in your lives. There's a parable called the parable of the talents that I think displays this. And it goes something like this. There is a master and he has three servants. And the master is going away on a long trip. And so he gives each of the servants a talent. And a talent is simply a unit of gold. And so he gives to this first servant, he gives them five talents. The second servant uh, three talents, and then finally the third servant, one talent. And after going away for a long time, he returns and he gathers the servants and he asks them how that they did. What were they able to do with the talents? And the first servant comes up and he says, after thinking it through, I was able to invest your five talents and I grew it to ten talents. And the master says, well done, my good and faithful servant. The second servant comes up and he says, I took your three talents and after some time was able to grow it to six. And again, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then finally, it comes to the third servant who had the one talent. And he said, well, I did not know what I could do to grow the money, so I buried it. And here it is. I haven't lost it. And the servant's response to him was to take the talent away from the one who did nothing with it and give it to the one that had grew the five to the ten. And this parable can be interpreted many different ways, but here I'm talking about the spiritual growth. Because all of you, despite your background, God's calling on you and your unique gifts to do something with your gifts. And I wonder which of you who profess to be Christians, which of those servants would you be? Is God at the end of your day is going to want to be satching away the talent from you? And if he is, if that bothers you, know that you can change, that you can move away from that and you can be like the others who take the unique gifts that you have and you can share them. And you may think, because of your background or your limitations, that God cannot use you. But anyone who's read the Bible knows there are many of stories where God has lifted up the weak and used them for good. Moses had a speech impediment. Mighty Moses, the one who led the Israelites across the Red Sea, had a speech impediment. He was giving great speeches to the Israelites. He did not want any part of it. 
And yet God said, you're my God. I want you to lead. You can do that. And when God tells you to do something, it's wise to do it. And so he lifted up Moses and he lifted up others. He lifted up Gideon. Gideon was the weakest of his family, the weakest of his tribe in Manasseh. And yet God called upon him to lead his people against the Midianites. And they were victorious. So God can lift up the weak. And sometimes God uses the weak specifically because he knows that it humbles the world. Because the world would tell you if you're powerful and you've done all these things and you're important, and it's all nonsense. Or as it says in the Bible and Ecclesiastes, it's all hevel, it's all nothing, it's all vanity. Because it will all pass away, we will all die. Instead, God can take you, he can mold you into a vessel, he can mold you as a, a piece of clay to do great things for him, to do great things for your family and others. Because the benefits of your life by giving your life to Christ will not only benefit you, but it will benefit future generations. Your children will be blessed by your example. Your grandchildren will be blessed. Think about how many things that you may be chasing after today, but what benefit will they have two, three generations from now? And yet you living a life that honors God will have just that. And you will be a light to others. That's why it says in Jesus Christ, he is the light. As it says in uh, John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. When Christ came into the world, he is a light to the world to expose the darkness, to expose the wickedness and the ignorance. And as Christians, we take that light and we share it for others. Because we are to be that city on a hill, that light to others to give them permission that they too can rise above the troubles in their life. They too can live a righteous life. They too can be perfect in Christ. Many people try to be perfect without Christ and they fail miserably. I know because I was one of them. But with Christ, things are possible that would be without him. It says the things that are impossible of man are possible with God. God is not limited in the same way we are. We're limited. We're finite. We have a limited experience of what we know. We're controlled by our environment and our experiences. But God is an all-knowing, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient being. And he's not limited in that way. And he can use you for good. And all it requires is you to have humility, calls for you to uh, call out to him in a moment. And that's all it can take. It's amazing how much, how much your life can change in a moment simply by giving your life to God. I know people, some people who are low people, some not very good people. But in a moment they change their life and they are not the same. They walk differently. Even the people when I run to in my own life, they know that I've changed. And there are a lot of folks that don't like it, I assure you, because that's a reality is when you change your life, when you give your life to God, you are going to be seen differently. Your light is going to shine and some folks aren't going to like it because it's going to cause them to feel differently about themselves because they know in their heart's heart that they're settling, they're choosing not to do all the things they ought to do for God, and they feel convicted. So that's something that early or new Christians have to deal with, but don't worry about that. You will lose friends, but you will gain new ones. You will give up the bar life. You will give up other things that don't suit you, but you will be filled with other things. It's funny, the things that I enjoy now that I would have thought crazy five, 10 years ago. Now I love reading the Bible. About five years ago, I tried reading the Bible. It meant nothing to me. I thought, oh, it would be a good academic exercise. Everybody talks about the Bible. Might as well read it. I tried to. Didn't mean a thing to me. But when I saw my life humble, when I had looked on the Bible with fresh eyes, I'm forever changed. When I read the Word, I'm forever changed. When I read the Scriptures, because I know the power behind it, I know the conviction. I know that there are people out there who felt it was so important. Know this Bible that we're giving away for free. There are people that have died so that common folks like you and me could read it. Think about what that says. Think about how important that was. 
And it's not just regular folks like William Tyndale, who believed that the, the plowboy should receive the word. The reg that just means a person who was a laborer. He died, on the cr he died at the stake, burned alive, because he translated the Bible to English so that you could read it. And yet many people will dismiss it. Immanuel Kant is a great German philosopher, one who read many books. And he said a few things about the Bible too. Let me see if I can find it here. There's also, I'll get back to Emmanuel Kant in a minute where I can find the page, but Isaac Newton, another brilliant man of science, believed that the, the scriptures of God were sublime philosophy. He could not envision living his life without it. It's remarkable how in such a short time we've abandoned such beliefs here in the West. We live in a post-Christian world, and yet that philosophy, those beliefs shaped our lives. And here we go. This is what Immanuel Kant said. He said, the majesty of the scriptures astonishes me. The Bible is the greatest benefit which the human race has ever experienced. A single line in the Bible has consoled me more than all the books I have read besides. What a powerful testimony that is from a brilliant man. One who had thought about things deeply on a philosophical level, and yet, with considering all the books that are available to him, they do not compare to the wisdom of the Bible. If you do not believe that, I challenge you to start reading the book of Proverbs. You can read a chapter a day, you can finish it in a month, and it will speak to you, it will speak to you about your life, things that you can change. It's amazing, amazing that a book had been written so long ago, but it still have great influence in your life and that is available to each and every one of you as I said we have Bibles we can give away here for free but you can also get them online at BibleGateway.com but the challenge for most people here in the West is that we become complacent and content with our lives and the belief that we do not need God so we disregard him and as a result we started to see erosion in our culture, we started to see things that people couldn't even imagine start to appear in our lives. We start to devalue life. We promote things like abortion. We promote the death of people. We promote the idea of sinicide, that the, that the older people, their value does not matter. And these ideas are far from Christianity. From the very beginning, Christianity was a belief in the value of life, that everyone's life matters that there is a purpose for you, that you are special. Christians from the earliest days pushed against abortion. They pushed against infanticide. They freed early slaves with the very idea because they believed their lives had value and they could not stand by and watch those things go. And yet, when we reject Christian values, we replace them with pagan ones. And you, when you reject life, you celebrate death. When you reject selflessness, you celebrate selfishness. We're seeing that come into our world in so many different ways. And it's not something, it's not just one thing, but drip by drip, we see that erosion. And part of the reason is because people have lost their faith in the Creator. But their lack of belief does not make God go away. Their lack of belief does not change because the Bible is clear. It says there is coming a day when God is going to judge the world in unrighteousness. Make no mistake about it. At the end of your days, you will stand before the almighty God and all your thoughts, words, and deeds will come before him. And in that day, you're going to want to have an advocate with the father. You're going to want to have someone to, to vouch for you because you will not want to get justice. I certainly would not want to get justice for the things that I have done. 
What I'm going to be begging for and hoping for is mercy. And you can receive that through Christ. You can have that advocate with the Father in Christ if you will allow it. But again, there is the rub. Are you willing to humble yourself? Are you too proud? For God opposes the proud and he will bring them down. And you better hope that your pride doesn't pull you away from God. You better hope that you do have a come to Jesus moment where you will not push away his message. Because there are many people who live their lives without such an experience and they're content in this world and they're miserable in the next. So the ones who benefit, the ones who are struggling, ironically, the ones who've had all types of hardships in this world, they actually are blessed in a way because God opens their eyes and they're humble and they're willing to seek out his message that a lot of regular folks who have average lives, who are con generally content and just want to chase after the things of the world, they're never in a position where they're humbled enough to receive God. And so they are lost. They become their own jailer by their own design. But that does not have to be you. You do not have to go through a, a terrible experience. You can come to God in a moment. You can reject what other people may think. It does not matter what other people think ultimately before God. They're not going to stand with you before God. It will be just you and him in that moment. And if you're living a life that does not honor him, that is a very scary time for you. And so that's a question you should think about. Are you ready to stand before God and be judged? Have you thought about those days? Are you making changes in your life? Are you seeking after God? As some of you, and this is what I used to think, that there would be plenty of time for me to get right with God, there'd be plenty of time for me to make my life right. But this life is a fragile life. Just to give you an example, just a few weeks ago, I was in a car accident. It's something, it's very fortunate I'm actually here talking to you tonight. And I was just ri driving down the road and a car veered into my lane and hit me. And I could have died in that moment. My life could have been over. There's nothing special about a car accident. They happen every day. People die. I'm sure many of you have seen those crosses or flowers on the side of the road. People don't think that'll be them, but those people that were in those accidents had the same thought, and it was them. And if they're not right with God, that's it for them. There is no more. There is no chance to get right with God. So there is an urgency, and all types of things can happen in this life. When I was in law school, there was a girl. She was a brilliant, good-looking woman. She was the type of girl that many would like to marry or you'd love to have as your daughter. And she was well-liked by everyone in her classes, and she made good grades, and her future seemed bright. It seemed like only with a little bit of time, her name would be on the side of some building that she makes partner, and she would be this very important person that we are proud to have as a, an alumni. And yet one day in class, she stood up and she talked, and she said that she was diagnosed with brain cancer. In a moment, all the things that she thought was important, chasing after these material things, chasing after the big house and the cars, and the big name, and the reputation, in a moment, all of that vanished. It was unimportant. And so that's something that you should think about when you're living your life is if you only had one more year to live, what would you value in your life? What would really matter to you? What happens next? Is there an afterlife? Is there something more? And are you ready to, to receive it? Because I'm going to tell you, that it's not going to be the material things. It's not going to be these nihilistic desires that you'll be thinking about in those final moments. It's going to be thinking about these other deeper things on what is to come. God bless you. And so I hope that you receive these words. No matter your background, whether you're an atheist or a Satanist or maybe from some other religion, I hope that you hear these words and you start to think about them. 
I hope to be a pebble in your shoe that you take with you, that you will not want to push out in time, that you will choose to seek after God. Because I believe if you will, it will change your life just like it's changed mine, just like it changed many of my brothers and sisters. God bless you. There's also an interesting thing. A lot of folks, I had some friends who would hear, hear the words and they're always looking for some type of uh, get out of jail free card, some type of exemption that's going to allow them to have all this uh, worldly fun. And yet at the end, they'll have a deathbed conversion and it'll be all good. They'll get the best of all, both worlds, they'll think. However, there's one problem with that. Number one, you're not promised a deathbed conversion. But number two, the problem with sinning, as I mentioned earlier, is once you start the process of sinning, there's a great risk that you won't want to stop in time because it becomes a habit. It's just like doing good is a habit. Doing evil can become a habit too. Some of those folks, even in their younger years, they said, I'll get back to God. I'll, I'll get right with him. In the end, when the end comes, they've gotten so used to sinning, they've gotten so used and set in their ways that they won't want to change. And because God is a gentleman, God will give you what you wish for. So if you want to live a life away from him, if you want to reject his values, reject his morality, then in the end, he will let you go away and he will ultimately reject you. And so if that hurts your feelings, good. Because that means that your heart isn't fully convicted yet. It means that there's still time for you when you can walk away from those things and can embrace God in your life. And I hope for some of you that if you haven't already, that today could be that day. People may not realize this, but the Bible says that uh, when you sin, you are doing the work of the devil. That may sound like a crazy statement here in the post-Christian uh, world we live in, but when you sin, you are not honoring God, and when you're not honoring God, you're opposing God. And Satan is a word that stands for adversary. So when you are sinning, you are an adversary of God. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14, it reads, and this is talking about the devil, but when you do the works of the devil, you are essentially the devil. It says, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And that is what most people do. And that's what a lot of people do. They exalt themselves. They put down God and say, I don't have to follow him. I don't like God because of this reason or that. Because he allows this thing. I will reject him so that I can live my life my own way. And so as it says in Romans 1.18, it will suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And they will do the things that they want to do and reject their creator. They'll find all types of reasons all types of rationalizations to hold on to their, their sin of choice, the thing that they like to do, and they will end up making an idol of it. But they deceive themselves by their thinking. They deceive themselves, fooling themselves to thinking that they're a random accident. There are too many examples, the complexity of life there are plenty of deductive arguments that show the existence of God. Think of how complex the world is. Man cannot create the world. Man, we can use the example of the teleological argument. The Greek word teleos means a proven design or purpose. And you look at any of these buildings where they have their bricks, and it has the edifice, it has the signs, it has the glass, it has the lights. 
And we know all these things did not come together on their own. We know they had a builder. We know they had an architect. And I assure you these buildings and these cars are complex, but they're nothing in comparison to the complexity of the world. They're nothing in comparison to the complexity of your body and your DNA. And so if it follows that these buildings and these cars had a creator, had a builder, then so much more does the universe, so much more does you. And so there is no reason to reject God. There is no good reason to reject God. People reject God out of selfish reasons because they want to do other things. They want to be in charge of their lives and they do not want to give up agency. But it is elusive and it's folly. You are much more than a chemical reaction. Be wary of anyone that would have you believe that love is simply a chemical. We know better than that. Deep down, we know that we're here for a purpose. We're not just randomly going through life. We know that there, we are to be good. We know what evil is. And we know this because God has etched this on our hearts. And if you seek after him, if you read God's word, you can be shaped by it. You can become better men and women. You can become a, a better figure in your community. And you can honor your creator. And when you think about it from the atheistic viewpoint, what a sad life that they live. They have to admit the absurdity of life. That nothing really matters. It doesn't matter if they're an evil criminal or the greatest humanitarian. From the atheistic viewpoint, it makes little difference because life is absurd. We're all going to die. The earth is going to pass away and there will be nothing left. And yet, atheists do not live their life that way. Atheists will be strong. If you ask them, if you believe you're an atheist, what do they think if, uh, about adultery? Is that okay if you sleep with their wife? Suddenly they will have a morality then very easily. Suddenly they will understand right and wrong. And there is a meaning and things do matter. And they will contradict themselves in the process. So be wise and do not be like them. As I have said many times, the fool says in their heart, there is no God. I've said a, a lot of strong words uh, that may make you think that I am mad at, at people or do I not, that I not love people. I want you to, to know that that is not the case. I'm here and my brothers are here and Christians across the world evangelize out of love for you. We're called to do it, but we do it because we hope that uh, people will be saved and their lives will be changed. We hope that uh, you will take in God's word and it will shape you. And this may seem crazy to some people, but I'll tell you, I've read so many stories where people will have heard a message like this and thought it was crazy in a moment. And then a couple years later, they are Christians. And they become true believers because that message resonates with them. They take it with them and they are changed. We do what we do out of here for glory to God, out of love for him, that we are not shamed of the gospel, that we want this good news to be shared across Bricktown, across Oklahoma, across the United States, and across the world, out of love for each and every one of you, because we know what it's done for our lives, and we want that to be available to each and every one of you. There's a story in the uh, 1900s that kind of expresses this sentiment. There was a famous violinist who was well known, and he played at all the famous concert halls, and 
at music places in people's homes. They paid him tons of money to do it because he was very good. And yet, uh, he, even though he acquired a lot of money this way, because he was a musician, he did not care about money. And so he gave most of it away to people who were less fortunate. And so that put him in a spot where he was looking to buy this uh, very popular violin. But he did not have enough money to buy it. So he went back to kind of pull money from his friends to buy this violin. It had been sold to a collector. But undaunted, he went to reach after the collector. They said, I'd like to buy that, uh, that uh, violin from you. But the collector said, no way. This is my most prized possession in the world. I'm not going to give it up. So the violinist said this, he said, well, at least let me play it one time before you put it on your, your trophy case, on your mantle. And so he started to play the violin because he was a great violinist. He played it amazingly well, so much well that it moved and it pulled on the heartstrings of the collector. And at the end, the collector said, I've changed my mind here. Take this violin. You must share it with the world. And you see, that is what we feel about the gospel message. We feel that it is the most beautiful and powerful thing. We want to share that steadfast love with God. We want to share it with you so we can take it with you so that you can be forever changed, so that you can be cleansed, so that you can receive eternal life and be blessed all of your days. And that's why we're here today to share our message with each and every one of you. What I'd now like to do is kind of turn the floor over to one of my, my newfound brothers here to share his testimony, if he could, for a couple of minutes. Because I want you to know this is not just my story. There are many others, too, have been experienced by this. And so this is his first time speaking, so please bear with him. But I think that uh, you will find that his story resonates with you. Here we go, brother. God bless. Hello. My name is Brother Randy Hinkle. And, uh, There was a time in my life whenever I was not a follower of the Jesus Christ. There was a time in my life where I was living a life after sin. And the Bible tells us that sin is only enjoyed for a season. It's not It's not good. In fact, the Bible tells us that it's a way to transgress from the law. And I want you to know that the simple life is indeed the hard life. This Would you like one of our cards? Christ, Take it with you. We've got a YouTube channel. You can see some more of our evangelism. You know, yeah, we're from, I'm from Dallas. What's up? He, he lives in Dallas. He's from, from Georgia. Uh, but you're welcome to call it too. But I was more the Facebook and YouTube. If you want to see some more videos. But thank you for your words. God bless you. And I remember laying in bed and worrying about death because I knew. I knew that if I died, that I would open my eyes in hell. And I want you to know, I was scared, scared of death. I was afraid that I might uh, puke and choke on my own vomit laying in bed. That's not a good feeling to have. That's not a good life to live. It's not a good thing to, to be there and, and worrying about that. But I knew about heaven and I knew about hell because I was raised in a Christian home. But I was not living for Jesus. You know, and, and, and that question right there, if a, if a man shall die, if a man dies, shall he live again? That's actually a question that, that was asked in, in the oldest book that we have in the Bible, in the book of Job, chapter 14, verse 14, he asked that very question. If a man die, shall he live? And that's a question that people still ask today. That's, that's the oldest book in our Bible. It's the oldest book known to man. That's a very old question. And that's the question that we're still asking today. If a man die, shall he live again? And the answer in the Bible is a resounding yes. If a man dies, he will live again. We are created with a soul. And our soul, we will open our eyes either in, in everlasting eternal punishment or in everlasting presence of God in, in, a, in an eternal bliss. And I... I want you to know, as, as the brother had read some verses earlier, and it started in Romans 3 and 23, and, and it says that for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And yes, sir. We've got a problem, and it, it is a sin problem. And the thing is, is, 
we do serve a holy God, and no sin can enter into His presence. And Amen. This is the fact, and we have all sin and come short of the glory of God. If we say we have no sin, we tell a lie. That's the problem. It's a sin problem. But like He went on to read, and He said that in, in, while God commended His love toward us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's and that's the thing we have to understand is. Although we do have a sin problem and we have all sinned and come short of that glory of God that Christ did indeed give his life for us. Why did he do that? Because the Bible goes on to tell us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The thing is, sin does bring death. The Lord might ask, how does sin bring death? Well, it started way back in Genesis. What sin is, is it's transgression against the law of God. And way back in Genesis, God gave Adam and Eve, the first created man, a command. Do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for in that day that you eat, you shall surely die. It's transgression against the law of God. Disobedience to his commands brings death. But what did the serpent do? You see, there's a deceiver out here that lies to us and tells us that it's okay to live a life of sin. Tells us to live a life. Uh, when we're pleasing ourselves, when we're not retaining God in our knowledge, that's what that's what the enemy does. He's a liar, and he lies to us, and he tells us to live a life for ourselves and to, and to live a life for that sin. He appeared to Eve in the Garden of Eden, and she knew the command not to eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. But what did he do to her? He told her, he said, In that day that you eat, you shall not surely die. But I want you to look around and ask yourself, where is Adam and where is Eve? They did die. They indeed died. Adam lived for 930 years or so, the Bible says, and he died. That's the fact. That sin brings death. And the Bible tells us that there is going to be a second death. There's going to be a resurrection unto damnation where those that are unrighteous are resurrected to damnation and those that uh, have given their life to Jesus are raised to life. The Bible tells us that, I'm going to read, read a few more verses here uh, out of Romans, but the Bible tells us that, give me just a minute, the Bible tells us that there is now therefore no condemnation of them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We don't have to live a life of condemnation. We don't have to live a life bound to sin. We can walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh, serving Jesus Christ. He has given us that freedom. He has given us the ability to rise up above sin and live free uh, to the bondages of sin. We don't have to live that, that, that hard life, the way of the transgressors. You don't have, have to, to be. Hard life, but we can indeed. You can give it up. Life, serving Jesus Christ. And I want you to know again, it is the free life. It is the good life. It brings peace and happiness. Yes, the storm still rages around us. The storm still goes on, but we can have peace in that storm. The Bible tells us that the wicked are like the raging sea. That when the water is stirred, that the, the dust and mire never settle. I want you to know that sinful and that wicked life, it brings trouble and it brings unrest and it brings... It brings a drama all the time. You can't get away from it. But there is, therefore, now no condemnation of them who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit. Who is that for? The Bible tells us that, who, that whosoever shall confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. It's for those that would confess in Jesus Christ. It's really that simple. It's a basic message. It's, it's Amen. so simple a three-year-old could understand it. If you would but give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, confess Him to be your Lord, repent okay. of your sins. Jesus said, I come not to call the righteous. Do you need a battery? I come not to call the righteous, but to call the uh, uh, sinners to repentance. That's what it is. It's a repentant life. Repentance means to repent of our sins, turn from their wicked ways. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, I would heal their land. Again, who is that for? The Bible goes on to tell us in Romans 10 and 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. As the brother mentioned earlier, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your heritage is. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's for you and it's for me. 
Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's what I'm telling you today. We're bringing you the good news of the gospel of Christ. But the Bible tells us that it is the gospel of Christ that is the power of God and the salvation. I want you to know that it's that simple. It's accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's really a simple message. I don't really understand why anybody would wait. If you ask yourself that question, if a man die, shall he live? And you understand and you know that there is, you know it, you feel it within within yourself that, that there is more. We have that hope. And that's what we're bringing you today is the hope that He's we settling have. In now. The hope in Jesus He's Christ. He's settling in now. He's got a See, we're, look, we're looking for that blessed hope. But the Bible says as Christians, we have a blessed hope. And we're Amen. looking for that. It's the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have hope. We have hope that one day that we will see him again. There will be people here who need to hear your voice. We will be reunited with loved ones who also made Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. We have got that hope, and you don't have to die without that hope. You don't have to die uh, worrying about what your your eternal um, your eternal home. You don't have to die worrying about that. You can have the hope, the same hope that is within us. The Bible tells us in Romans 8 and 11 that the, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells within us. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within us as believers. Once we accept Amen. Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we've got that same spirit dwelling within yes, us. Sir. And I want you to know if you want that freedom and you want the spirit of God in your life, you can have it. All you got to do is, 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 is bow before him, repent of your sins, and, and confess him to be your Lord and Savior. It's really that simple. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God brings liberty. I want you to know that there is liberty. It is in the Spirit of God. It is, it is in this life receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It does indeed bring liberty. It brings freedom. That very thing, has, that very idea and this old-fashioned message and this old gospel has changed countless lives. Many, many people have been set free from bondages that they have not been able to shake. They have not been able to turn, turn away from them. And I've got a similar story. You see, I was bound to things when, whenever I was lost and living that life of sin and, and uh, rejecting God. I was bound to things. I was bound to alcohol. I, I didn't, I never fell into, into any hard drugs or such things, but there were other things in my life that I was bound to. I remember being bound to nicotine. And, and for me, I wanted free from it, but I couldn't get free from it. I wanted free from it just because I knew it wasn't good for me, just because I knew it wasn't healthy. And I wanted free from it, and I couldn't get uh, find it within myself to get free from such things. I remember trying to put down the cigarettes, and, and, and I wanted to save my lungs. And I remember not being able to quit smoking. I remember uh, picking them back up and turning back to them. I can remember that. I have those memories. I remember that whenever I finally got free from cigarettes, I picked up the can sir. of Copenhagen. That's how I found freedom from cigarettes. I was able to quit then. It was easy. I had something else to back up. You want me to give you a gospel track, sir? Whenever I went to quit, uh, Would you like a gospel? Uh, quit that can of Copenhagen, I was unable to. I couldn't find it within my God bless you. It was a similar story. Uh, same thing. Same, same old story, just a different temptation, different problem. And I remember trying to put it down and not being able to and just always going back to it. But I remember praying. I remember one day whenever I got saved, whenever I was I was actually sitting on a church, my story, sitting in a church. I heard the, the pre preacher was preaching about the glory of God. And I remember wanting to give my life to Jesus. And, and so I did. I went down to an old fashioned altar. I repented of my sins. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I got up from there a new man with a new name. I'm not, I'm not the same no more as I was then. I got there with a new walk and a new talk. The things I used to do, I don't want to do no more. Nevertheless, I still had an addiction. I still had a bondage that I wanted to be set free from. I was in my early 20s. I was single. I didn't have a wife. I prayed that God would send me a girl that would help me want to be able to quit that nicotine habit because I wanted free from it. And, and you can do what you want with that, but for me, I wanted free from it. And I'm going somewhere with this. The thing is, is what I found is God did send me a, a girl that, had a, that did not want like that stuff. 
And uh, I still couldn't, that still that wasn't it. That's not where the answer was. The answer wasn't in a girl. The answer wasn't in anything that this world had to offer. But yes, sir. one day, I finally, I finally come to a point to where I just wanted free, and I began to actually ask God for help. I actually turned to him and asked God to set me free. And, and I was able to finally put that down and turn from it and never pick it up again. Something that I was not able to do in and of myself. That's the thing. I'm telling you that there is liberty in the Spirit of God, and there is freedom from things, from sin and things that confound and things that you can't find freedom from. Why not give it a try? Why not give it a shot today? Have you tried Jesus before? I would like to encourage you, if you have not, to give him a shot. I want you to know he's be he's the best friend a man could have, and, and uh, stick it closer than a brother. And, and if I could just encourage you to do anything, it would be don't wait another day, don't wait another minute, but give your life to Jesus. It is indeed the best thing that I ever did. And since I've given Amen. my life to him, uh, I just I just love him and I love the spirit that I feel. I love the uh, freedom that he has brought to me. I love the, the I, knowing that I, knowing without a shadow of doubt that if I die today, and I, and I will, that I will live again, and that I will live in the presence of God. And if I could just encourage anybody to do Sorry. anything, it's just to give your life to Jesus. It is the good life. You got to remember, the Bible tells us, and it is true, the Bible has withstood the test of time, all the scrutiny that it could ever, uh, could ever be thrown up against it. It's been thrown up against it, and it has withstood the test of time. And the Bible does tell us that the way of the transgressor is hard. That is the hard life. This Christian life, it might be the straight and narrow. It might not be the broad and wide and popular way. But it, nevertheless, it is still the easy life. If you know what, if you understand where I'm going with that, it is that you can have peace in the storm. You can have uh, freedom even in this time, in this world, whenever society puts so much on us to follow it through the world and to not really live for the Lord. And that's what we do so often. As, like, like Brother mentioned earlier right here, and, in, in Bricktown, Oklahoma, many people, many people go to the church and they sit on the pew in a pretense but never have really repenting of their sins. Maybe we just repeated a prayer after a preacher without really meaning it. But Jesus said that he come not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. The thing is, is it does indeed take a repentant heart. It takes repentance of our sins. That's what it takes. It takes accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And it really is indeed that simple. Why would you wait? I don't understand why anybody would wait any longer uh, than, than, than right now. Today is the day of salvation. You've got to understand that you are never promised another day. You are never promised another breath. We're living on borrowed time. Everybody who has ever lived 150 years ago, for sure, I think it would be safe to say, has died. They're not alive anymore. They've opened their eyes in eternity. The thing is, is it is appointed to man wants to die. And we must understand that we have a choice. It's an opportunity here, right now. You're hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're hearing the message that you need. The secret that you need. It ain't no secret. The thing is, is God give it to us and he give it to us to preach. To preach to you. For you to hear. For you to know that there is a way to be saved. There is a way to make heaven your home. There is a way to open your eyes in the presence of God. Free from, from, from uh, eternal damnation. And, and the alternative is not so nice. The alternative does not look good. The Bible talks about a place where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. Where there will be gnashing of teeth. And I want you to know that we don't have to go to that place. That's not the place that I want to go. It ain't going to be fun. It ain't going to be good. But I want you to know that there is a good way. And, and it is not the way that seems right to man. But it is only through Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yes, it sir. is through Jesus Christ. There is no other way to heaven other than through the door. Anybody who tries to go any other way is the same as a thief and a robber. But there is one way, and it is through Jesus Christ, through that blood that was shed upon Calvary's cross. And I want you to know that you can have that. You can have that everlasting life simply simply by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, repenting of your sins, and serving Him. Like the brother said, my first time to speak, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to share your testimony? I get too nervous, man. Okay. Right okay, that's fine. Yeah. All right. No worries, praise God. What's up? Sorry, I'm not very, don't have very much. No, no. Thank you, Brother Randy. Always a blessing to hear a Christian's testimony. My name is Brother John. I'm here with Christ Forgiveness Ministries. And if you happen to be in the area, I came up from uh, Dallas. 
But you happen to be in the area. We're going to be here tonight and tomorrow. And we always blessed to hear other Christians. So if you have some time, be sure to come by. Be happy to shake hands and hear about your story, hear about your own evangelism, hear how God has shaped your lives, and see how you've been a light to your community. My family uh, came from uh, Oklahoma. I spent many of my summers here in Oklahoma, so I'm always grateful to come back to Oklahoma. I love it here, and uh, one of the reasons I love it here is because of the the history of Oklahoma. Oklahoma folks are, are hardy folks. It's in their DNA, their epigenetics. They have survived the Great Depression. They survived the, the Trail of Tears. Many, they survived the Dust Bowl, and many of you have that blood coursing through you. There's a certain strong character that is built by those qualities. There's strong character for those who have, have, have tilled the land, have worked the land. And that's built into the fabric of Oklahoma. So I'm always blessed to come to Oklahoma. And no doubt many of you have heard those stories many times, probably in classes here, to share you about the struggles that past generations dealt with. And yet, the one frustration that I have is when I return to Oklahoma as I see some of the changes. And unfortunately, some of those changes aren't for the better. I see a, a type of uh, laziness that has kind of set in as people have moved away from that uh, working hard till the sun goes down culture to replace with a kind of a boredom of what shall we do. Uh, I started to see signs popping up talking about uh, drug addiction in Oklahoma and this devastated me as a child and as I've gotten older it bothers me more and more. I'm concerned about the and it affects us. My grandfather was a, a pastor here in Oklahoma. He used to preach over, uh, he preached in a number of places, but one place was over in Ada. And uh, he would preach against the sin of, of that day, and one of them, which was alcohol. That was the big, that was the big sin that a lot of people could not uh, get hold, let go of. And that's one thing you find out about your faith on how much you love God is when you're willing to give up that sin that you crave so much. And unfortunately, in that example, my grandfather's time in Ada was not long as there were folks who were unwilling to give up the alcohol bottle. They were unwilling to give up their drunkenness. But they didn't make what he did was wrong because he still was calling out to them for love. And I realized that uh, there will be folks here who do not like to hear my, my negative message against drugs. They will have rationalized it. The last time I was here in March, I talked to uh, a couple of folks who had become addicted to various drugs. And amazingly enough, they were quoting me scripture, defending their, their drug use. They had rationalized it so much. They were so intent on holding on to uh, their sin that they weren't willing to do anything they could to hold on to it. And I'll find this is the case for many folks. We see this in the progressive Christianity movement, where they have refashioned God's morality, they've refashioned basic principles of Christianity to invent a new gospel, a new God that they can worship on their own terms. But all these things are merely rationalizations pulling you away from God, pulling you away from the, the true creator. And as I mentioned earlier on, my own greatest sin was my idolatry of money, my chasing after money. That was the thing I was willing to do anything for. That was my quote unquote drug of choice. And it had devastating consequences in my life. And just like most sin does, it has negative consequences in your life. And you can't always appreciate them in the moment, but slowly but surely it will start to destroy your life in ways you could not even imagine. And not only does it affect your life, but it affects the life of people around you. And that's why it is important to live a life that honors God, that it's important to live a life that is selfless and not selfish. And so unfortunately, there have been folks that have chosen to, to go their own way and gone away 
from God's morality, and we see that erosion in our culture. We see that erosion in the values. It's very frustrating for me to see those snapshots in time, to see how Oklahoma has changed in some ways. And not all the changes have been bad, but some of the changes certainly have been. And one of the reasons for that is we've rejected God and in so doing his morality. And when you reject God, you embrace other things, things that are ultimately not going to serve you. If you would like to have a real conversation about that, brother, you're welcome to come here. I'd be happy to talk with you. Many times when we're out street preaching, there will be somebody who will come along and say something like that and say, hell, Satan. I guess they believe that it's original, but however, from a street preacher's perspective, we hear that type of thing all the time, and it means very little. All it means to me is how foolish that you would celebrate someone who hates you and wishes the death of you, doesn't love you like the Almighty God loves you, doesn't have that steadfast love that I spoke about before, and yet there will be people who will choose to celebrate that life. But the truth is, he probably doesn't even believe that, but if he's making choices that are contrary to God, he's living his life that same way. And so how sad for him, I feel, feel bad for him, I hope that he changes, I hope that he hears these words and they resonate with him tonight or tomorrow or something else happens and he starts to think about these things in a real way because the amazing thing is that that man in an instant can change his life. That man in an instant can come to God and he can be completely different. Where he was a jokester there or even a hater of God, in a moment he can change and he become the biggest disciple of Christ. He can become the biggest light to others. And it's a beautiful thing. It's such a beautiful thing to see people change their lives for good. Such a beautiful thing to see them change their lives for the better. And that's something that's available to each and every one of you. Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter your background. Does not matter what you've done. In a moment in time, you can humble yourself you can get down on a knee and pray to God to bring him into your life and you can begin the change process. And I tell you, there's no better time than today. There's no better time to start that process now. You do not have to be like me and spend years of wasted time. I look back on my life and think, why didn't I get smarter so much sooner? Why didn't I get into the word years ago? Because I think with regret that had I done so, I would be able to craft a better sermon, a better message that would be able to reach you in a way that I cannot right now because of my limitations. My only, my only saving grace here is it's not about me and my abilities. The message, whether you receive it and accept it, it is the power of God that works through you. And so God will clean up my mistakes if you're willing to receive it. God will clean up my uh, mispronunciations of words or my getting a, a verse wrong or forgetting a, a good parable to share. He will shape that with you. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit that he can connect the dots. And if you're earnestly seeking after God, God will find you. The Bible talks. It says if you seek God, you'll find it. If you knock the door will be open to you. If you are earnestly seeking after a relationship with Christ, he will find you. That is his word. That is his promise that's available to each and every one of you. In a world where so much cynicism, so much negativity, so much, so much fear and anxiety and frustration, we see it in the news. The news is filled with all these uh, zombie movies over the last few years or all these catastrophe movies about the great pending doom is to come. People know that things are starting to change. They know that things are not necessarily changing for the better and they're anxious and they're worried and we have these things coming up. We have certain plagues that come along. And they demand you to wear certain things, to wear, wear a little amulet around your ears, to drink the magic potion, 
and that you will be saved, you will be cured from all these things. But they are illusions and distractions. People know at a deep personal level that things are changing and they're not changing for the better. But if you are a Christian, you know these days are coming. You know why they're coming. And if you're a Christian, you can prepare yourself for those days to come. You can prepare yourself for those times in the future. I was just speaking with a lady a, a moment ago, and she was telling me she believed the end times are near. Now, I don't necessarily share that sentiment, but there are good reasons to think that things are changing and things are getting worse. And if you do have that thought going through your mind and you are not set right with God, today would be a very good day to get right with God. Today would be a very good day to be on the Lord's side. Because this walking away from God is nothing new in history. This isn't the first plague to come along. If you didn't know, there have been many plagues throughout history. There are many times when folks have decided to kind of go their own way, to try to become gods in their own guise, to try to chase after other gods. And yet there is always a time, there's times in the Bible where he calls you, he calls through his prophets, he calls through his leaders, he calls you to make a decision, a finality, a line in the sand, where he asks you that question, are you on the Lord's side? Are you with God? As many people will profess that they are, but their lives, their actions are far from it. And so we are calling you with a strong message that if that resonates with you, if you feel convicted with those words, then now is the time to start taking actions to walk away from the things that do not serve you and do not honor your almighty God. In the Bible, we see this story. We see the story in Joshua. Joshua was a great military leader. And he called on his people because he knew that they started to stray and go after other idols. In those days, those were idols of stone and wood that validated some more carnal things they wanted to chase after. In our day, we don't necessarily call them idols, but when you worship money, when you worship material things, when you worship the carnal desires, you're making idols of those things. When you're putting beauty above your relationship with God, you're falling short of the proper communion with God. And so Joshua drew that line in the sand to Israelites then, and he called out to the, the tribes, and he said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. He wasn't messing around. He knew the fears, the concerns, and the degradation that happens when you walk away from God, when you revolt against his morality, and in that moment, they found out who believed in God, who loved God, when the Levites came over to him, because they believed. And I'm here today to tell you that I believe in God. I'm here to tell you today, in September of 2021, I'm not ashamed to tell you that I believe in the Almighty God. I'm proud of what he's done for my life. I'm proud of what he's done for my brothers and sisters' life. And I want to share that with each and every one of you. Some of you may believe that God is dead or God went away. He was some type of watchmaker that created creation and, and wandered off. Do not be deceived. Do not be fooled by false words of those who are trying to rationalize their sins. They do not love you. They want to take you down with them. It is the work of the devil. But there is hope. In a world of so much cynicism, there is hope with Jesus Christ. He is a light to us. He is a light to the world. And he can fill your life with that light. He can fill your life with a change that can shape you and mold you in ways that you can't fully understand now. It's only as you get older, older when you will understand why God was testing you and shaping you. 
That is the beauty of life. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. All you need to know right now is simply being willing to humble yourself and put your faith in God. If you're willing to do that, you can see your life changed. It will not happen over time. And your, all your problems will not go away. But you will be able to handle the burdens of your life much better. You will have a new perspective on life. You will see things differently. The things that you used to love, you will no longer love. The things that you thought were so important now, they just don't matter so much. And the things that you will start to value, that relationship with God, that, that eagerness to share God's love with others, will shape your lives more than you will ever know. And so that's why we're here today. We're here to glorify God and his word. But we're here also to reach the lost. In the Bible, there's a Bible called the parable of the sower. And this is Jesus Christ talking and he talks about this sower. If you don't know what a sower is, it's just somebody before machinery would have seed and he would scatter it in the fields in the hopes and time that it would grow. And the parable goes that he first some of this seed fell on hard soil. And because it was hard soil, it did not grow. And he had other seed he built on land that it was softer land, but there were thorns in it. And these thorns grew and choked up the seed so it was not able to grow. And yet another example, he threw on another type of soil. But the birds came along and took the seed away. And yet finally there was some seed that landed on fertile soil and it grew and it was good. And this parable is the message. Many of you, depending on where you are in your life, may receive this message or you may reject it. You might be that hard soil that it doesn't matter what anyone could say to you, you are not going to accept the gospel no matter what. And I pity those that are in that position. Yet there are others, they are willing to hear the word, they're willing to think about the word, but they'll let the distractions of the world pull them away from it. It's like the birds that came to get the seed away. And that could be your friends that are pulling you away from this message that you know you need to hear. That could be some other event that you're rushing to get to that ultimately does not matter. We're talking about your eternal life. But fortunately, we know that God's word never returns void. By speaking here today with me and my brothers, there will be someone who receives this message in that it will either strengthen their faith so they will renew their faith in Christ or it will start that process where they will seek after God and be changed. And how so beautiful that is. And oh, how wonderful that is to think that some words and in some small way we could be a part of that that could shape someone's life. And that's why we're also out here today because we know that it makes a difference. We know that it changes lives and we know that could include you if you're willing to let it. And so we talked earlier about pride. How proud are you? How long will you run? How long will you stay away from God? Will you endure to the end? Running from God your whole life? Or will you be willing to humble yourself? Will you be willing to seek after your creator? Will you be willing to think about those deeper questions in life in such a way that you can change your life? We pray that you do. We pray that you seek after his message. We pray that you take in his word. In this world, it is a world filled of distractions. And the distractions can be so overwhelming. In Psalms, the psalmist says, Oh, that I had wings like a dove so I could fly away to give me rest. Many folks are so tired, they're, they're overworked, they got stresses from their families, they got stresses uh, with their children, they got stresses in the world at large, they're feeling under attack, and they just want rest, they just want a break, 
They don't want to hear the words, hear my words. They just, they just want to watch a little TV. They want to watch the game. They just want a, a little more rest, a little more sleep. But they will not find that rest in the world. They will not find that rest in a couple extra hours of sleep or uh, in drugs or alcohol or casual sex or any of these other things that the world would tell you are so important because those things will all pass. What you need if you want true rest, what you need if you want to have something that sustains is going to be with you that is timeless is rest in God. Rest in your almighty creator, that relationship and that knowledge that knows that whatever may happen in this life, whatever hardships may happen, that your soul is secure in the next life, that your soul is set up for eternity. And so if you aren't reading the scriptures, you're depriving yourselves of knowing God. There are a lot of folks that believe in God, but they've decided to create their own Bible of sorts. They're saying, I don't need to read the scriptures. I know. I feel. Oh my goodness, what a terrible word. I wish that could be banned. I feel. No, no. How about I think or I know or what, what does God say? These would be much better words. We should ban the words I feel. As I said before, I'm going to repeat it again because I really love this verse. But this is from Immanuel Kant, great German philosopher, more studied than most of the folks here, I imagine. And he said this, the majesty of scriptures astonishes me. The Bible is the greatest benefit which the human race has ever experienced. A single line in the Bible has consoled me more than all the books I have ever read. And to think that people choose to ignore the Bible, people choose to reject God's word, they choose to reject the very Bible that Western civilization is based upon and has transformed the lives of millions of people, not just around uh, Western civilization, but the whole world throughout time. What the scriptures provide is a gateway for you to build your relationship with God, to seek after him, to allow you to start to think about God and allow him to, to shape you. And what you can know is that when you enter a relationship with God, if you become a Christian, you join a brotherhood, a sisterhood of people throughout history and time who have sought after these questions, these deep philosophical questions, and that's all available to you. It's all available, that knowledge, that wisdom is available to you in the form of God's Word. And I challenge you, if you haven't, to start reading the Bible, whether you are a Christian or not, pray that God will reveal himself to you and start to read his Word. It's as simple as reading a couple chapters a day. If it take nothing else, just get up 30 minutes earlier when it's quieter, when the phone's not ringing, where there isn't the distractions of the day, and read a couple chapters and start to see what the Bible does for you. Start to see if it resonates with you. Pray to God for him to reveal himself to you. I believe that if you're humble and you're sincere, God will answer your prayers just like he has answered mine, just like he's answered my brothers and sisters around the world. And that's why we're here today to share with you the gospel, to share with you that message of God's love. I spoke earlier about the gospel, and I'm going to share it again because we have a bit of a different audience now. But the gospel message is good news in a world that has fallen. And those may be theological terms to you that you may not have heard, but we live in a state where God created a perfect world for us to live in, but we made choices that have pulled us away from God. Because the choices that we've pulled us away from God, 
We have rejected God and we are in grave, we are in grave peril because if we stood before God based on our actions, we'd be found guilty for rejecting his love. But because God is a God of love and he did give us free will, he was not satisfied there. He also allowed his son to take human form. And Jesus Christ lived a life without sin, doing all the right things, upholding the law, upholding all the morality that God holds dear as an example to the rest of us, but also so that he could be a sacrificial lamb for us. So that when he was uh, nailed on that cross, when he was crucified, when he was bruised for our transgressions, that that was our atonement. That was our being able to go free. It was our payment of the debt that we accrued. He paid that for us out of love. And the only thing that he asks in return is that you seek after him, that you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And you start to honor him with your words, your thoughts, your deeds and actions. That is the beauty of the gospel. That is the beauty of the steadfast love that is available to all.